really just to kind of start it off, I just wanted to, again, thank you for being willing to be on. And, you know, we had an email exchange um, about being able to, to have a chance to talk. And, um, you know, I, I'm curious as to because you I like the way you responded about how it was a, a quick um, decision in your head that absolutely you do the the conversation. Um, and just from my perspective, being able to uh, have more and more conversations on the topics of racism in, in the United States and, and our history and the way that we teach history, those types of things are, are really important and valuable to me. Um, and also just acknowledging as a white educator, uh, the, the background that I come from in terms of my own um, implicit biases and my own ignorance in the way that I've been uh, brought up in a system that ex- you know explicitly excludes uh, black voices and voices of color for so long, and how even as a history teacher, um, I'm seeing as I'm teaching classes a lot of blind spots in my own teaching and wanting to address that. So I really appreciate you coming on, and you know I'm curious, you know what what prompted the reaction that you had uh, to being on today, just as a, a starting point. Yeah, well, uh, Brad, it was, it was a pleasure to get your email. One, it was it was inspired by the uh, another podcast as mentioned earlier, and when I got yours, and you you noted that you were um, a white teacher, and there were issues of race that you discussed in your classroom, and you were sensitive to how how one might distill some of this information to students, and I was thinking that. You know your your interest in the subject matter, your interest in social justice movements and uh, Black Lives Matter and other things. To me, just clearly resonated. But also, I was reminded of how important it is for teachers to um, to be sensitive to these issues, to include them in the classroom, and in many ways disrupt these master narratives that often marginalize all sorts of folks and their histories. And so, in many ways, you're you know I consider you like an essential worker, if you will. You know, in terms of the educational system and most Americans don't get college degrees, and um, uh, except for Asian Americans, uh, if you sort of disaggregate uh, groups slightly more than half, would eventually get uh, college degrees. But you know, for most people, they they don't get a college degree. And high school, however, the vast majority of Americans across racial and ethnic lines get high school degrees, diplomas, and the high school diploma often comes with a uh, you know a few a number of history classes. And unfortunately, many people have a sort of, uh, some might call a, a saccharine sort of, you know, hagiographic notion of uh, U.S. history that, you know, has a narrative of, you know, the United States incessantly being a protector of democracy and freedom. And we've had some challenges, uh, you know, slavery, but America pre- prevailed. And we had some challenges with several water fountains and America prevailed. And America's fought for freedom and democracy for people and people have come all around the world to enjoy this freedom and democracy. And so there's uh, this profound ignorance that most of us have coming out of high school because of that. So when you reached out to me, I was excited because I was thinking like I've had you know scores of people I suspect in my life tell me that they never heard of this particular element of history until, you know, way after high school. And uh, and too often we don't have people like you in classrooms. So I was very excited to be here. And I, I, I can't think of I don't think I've ever spoken to a um, high school class, certainly not online. And I've, I've visited a couple of high schools, I guess, in my entire you know career of giving talks. And the vast majority of my my lectures are at universities. And uh, so I think it's really important. So anyway. Sorry for that very long answer, Brad, but thank you very much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Hey, anytime. And, and long answers are perfect for podcasts. But um, <laughs> uh, number one, put a, a pin in that idea about talking to high school classes, because I would absolutely love to um, do something, you know, especially whether it's virtual or not. Maybe it's a live Skype call type thing if we are back in the classroom, um, you know, in the reasonable future, whenever that is. I uh, would love to love to include you uh, in further dialogue on things, um, but uh, when you you brought up in your in your discussion just there, um, talking about people bringing up points in history that they were not aware of, and you know that's true for all of us, and and true for you know whether your background is just you know a few history classes in high school and then 
finding out stuff as you as you grow up. And part of what I was kind of uh, going into in the email to you and what I wanted to discuss today is I think it's very, very important to completely be transparent as educators. And, you know, I think we've done lip service to this in the past, but it's just even more important now in in the reckoning that we are are going through to acknowledge 100% completely that those of us that are in power are have giant blind spots. I mean, I was talking to my partner um, about the fact she was asking me a question about Tulsa uh, and the, the, the racial violence that occurred in Tulsa in the early 20th century and how I personally didn't know about that until I was student teaching just years ago. Um, and that is an incredible um, absence of information um, for me as an educator to have. And it's it's something that I think as as particularly white educators, we really need to own and acknowledge if we're ever going to grow past it. Um, just because, like you mentioned, the master narratives that we teach and um, have taught for so long in in history courses of you know, the United States having a few problems here and there, but ultimately being a protector of democracy. And even the voices of resistance that we do often include, like Martin Luther King Jr., you know, are, um, you know, targeted voices to include based on nonviolence and based on not necessarily, um, you know, challenging the system in any sort of um, direct way of, of, of like a power struggle or violence or something like that. And you know there are a lot of there are a lot of reasons that our system has been designed in the way that it has, and to include the narratives that it has, um, and also the narratives that it doesn't include, even for the people that are teaching the classes. So it's that's a a wake up call for myself personally over the past couple of years, but just in general to white educators um, and how how we conduct our history classes. Yeah, and it's a it's a very um... I think mature intellectually mature space to be in to you know recognize one's one simultaneously one's privilege but also one's ignorance and it's something that is not you know unique to uh, white you know teachers is uh, something that you know we have our privileges what I call situational privileges right so we have you know for me as a uh, you know heterosexual male Christian you know there are certain and to be a PhD in my class. There are a lot of privilege. I'm an American, right? So there are all these sorts of privileges I I have, even as a black person in a country that has been historically hostile to black people's freedom, right? And so there are all these things, like even with my, uh, how I examine you know, gender and sexuality uh, in my classes, in my research, uh, my how I uh, talk about LGBTQ movements or women's liberation movements and others, and even with a sympathetic ear, uh, but as an outsider's perspective, there are always all these limitations that often that bring to the table. I need to be constantly aware of, and uh, yeah, but it's something that is a function of of our work, and I think is something that we all struggle against. Struggle, you know, and, and I think it's not something that should be discouraging. I think it's great to be conscious of it, aware of it, and doesn't even mean that black folks who are talking about black history, whether we're male or female can, you know, no one captures everything. And so we have our areas of specialization and um, many of us have our blind spots. Now what I find so exciting about what I do is the limitless really uh, spaces of inquiry. And so as any historian of the United States, regardless of one's specialization, there's always more to know. There's always more nuance, more perspective, uh, more information, uh, more you know, sort of, ways that we can cause disruptions in how we interpret and what we think about the significance of this event. So I always find the work quite exciting. And, you know, I think for lay people, you might think that history is just sort of a fixed sort of narrative of things that happened in the past. And that's far from the truth, as, as you know. And so it's our task. But what I find exciting and invigorating about it is that this is, uh, you, we're, we're often the masters of this narrative and we can, we can engage it and we're empowered to, to offer new interpretations and, you have these, I open up these books from high school or books that were published years before I was born. Like there's this guy, um, um, uh, Moulton uh, Coulter, who's this like old school Southern historian who was an apologist for slavery and white supremacy in the Confederacy and the New South and all this. And he was this, you know, uh, giant in his field of Southern history. 
you know, and I can come around, you know, I'm, I'm sure he's rolling over in his grave, you know, to see people like me come, ro- come over and, you know, I'm not the only one. There are, you know, all sorts of historians who have disrupted his master narratives, refuted what he's said and, you know, offered all sorts of different interpretations. But this is empowering. and It's kind of exciting to know that the field has a sort of democratic element to it in some ways, you know, and it's, it's, it's a um, it's a robust area for all sorts of exciting intellectual interpretations that have social and political implications for our day right now. You've used the word exciting a bunch of times in this response just now, and and I agree with you um, in terms of the the true potential that is out there in in the study of history. I mean, and obviously that's something that has drawn both of us in our own respects towards you know, um, making this our career, what I, I, I always try to remind myself about that exciting aspect of this time when there are times when, you know, I do want to feel a sense of, of guilt and shame towards what I don't know. Um, and I think those are important emotions themselves. Um, but, you know, we've been having a lot of conversations um, as a school and and just teachers in general about um, the way that we can be activists in the classroom and and just in general in society there is a focus a little bit now on on the the, the feelings of shame and, and guilt and things that ultimately stop us from action and how that that anything that stops you from acting in anti-racist ways in terms of your career or in society and shame and, and guilt can can silence oneself um, those are, you know, emotions that are, are if, if not in check, can be just as problematic as um, continuing problematic behaviors, if anything's stopping you from, from action. And so when I try to reframe it in my mind, um, uh, to look at the exciting potential of what can be learned and what can be unlearned in terms of some of these master narratives, um, I, I think of all the potential that we have in our history classes, and I think that as educators of recent uh, memory, we've done a lot better job of highlighting how history is, perspectives, a, a collection of stories, who is who is being talked about here, who is being excluded, either directly or indirectly. But we're still in such an infancy stage of that because we still have these timelines that we... You know, again, we can't focus on everything in any class, and we do need some sort of controls to be able to um, focus on different parts, at least in general. Um, but there is so much potential that is exciting about what our history classes look like going forward, giving students more opportunity to have choice to to find things that they connect with or that resonate with them, um, while still keeping some positive constraints there to focus the discussions on maybe topics or or p- particular um, broad timelines, but not having to hit all of the quote-unquote, um, you know, greatest hits of American history and thus exclude a lot um, because we don't have time for it. So it's just, it is such a important topic and it is so exciting to think about what can come from here to build on what we've already done and to, you know, correct some of the, the missteps that we've had along the way. Yeah. And, and, you know, you make a good, a really good point that, you know, history, any, I mean, if you're looking at us history is so bad. I mean, when I say it's vast. I think about other countries, you know, hundreds of years older than the United States, but there, there's so much that we tr- you attempt to cover and it's hard to cover it all. So when you try to expand that history and some of the, the perspectives and the, the interpretations of race, class, and gender, we, um, we find ourselves met with additional challenges and trying to, one, adhere to major events, major figures. But um, when we talk about what I found is that one can talk about Woodrow Wilson and his notion of a League of Nations his notion of a an international peace. And while that's always been a part of U.S. history and classrooms since, I suspect, the 40s, it's been a, you know, a, a, a staple, the, the ways in which one can explore Woodrow Wilson's profound limitations when it came to, even, even as he said, let's make the world safe for democracy, here's a guy who when he came into office, was the first elected, he was absolutely hostile, explicitly so, 
So most Americans even have most adult Americans even have the right to vote. He didn't like the idea that women of any race should have the like right to vote. He he was opposed to the idea of black people having the same rights as white people. He was an avowed white supremacist. And so here's a guy who was sort of, um, you know, this poster boy for global peace and then, you know, orchestrating and putting together the League of Nations and arguing that uh, the sovereignty of nations should be respected and that European, uh, you know, quibbles and squabbles and internecine fights within, within countries and, of course, between countries that, he was sort of aghast at the hatred that he saw with these people. And he was like, well, you guys are all white guys. You know, why are you guys so mad at each other? Why do you guys want to blow and kill each other up, man? We're all, all white guys. And so they were like, and of course, race functions very differently uh, in, everywhere else in the world than the United States. And, and he was sort of like, we can all get together and respect each other's freedoms. And we're all the same, guys. You know, and, and when I say political sovereignty, uh, I'm not talking about the sovereignty of people in Asia or Africa or the Caribbean. I'm talking about in Europe, right? So don't invade each other's countries, but do what you need to do in other parts of the world. Imperialism outside of Europe is fine, right? And so but, but there are all these ways you can interpret the same guy. So that is so, I think this is one of the exciting things about history is that, and I keep using that word, you're right on the money there, Brad, but you can, you can craft a narrative. And again, this is based on evidence. So it's not just a process of polemic subjectivities and our own biases, all of which we all have. But it, this is also a process of using precise evidence to substantiate your contention. So when I talk about Woodrow Wilson being an avowed white supremacist, I'm not just saying that. I'm actually quoting him verbatim, right? I'm looking at the over two, uh, the over 20 policies that his administration instituted to, in fact, um, remove black people from positions of power in the federal government, right? To deny them access to jobs, to remove them from posts, right? To ensure that these are all white spaces, to ensure segregation in uh, cafeterias in the federal government. And so these are things that he did, right? I'm not making this stuff up. But history books, you know, generally didn't talk about that. Here was a guy who was a celebrant, who's a celebrant of, um, of of international peace, broker peace, Versailles Treaty, wanted the world to avoid future wars, and wanted to make the world safe for democracy. But but we get a chance to see a more complicated fellow. And also, I think what's, what is another perspective when we talk about Woodrow Wilson is that you know, here is one individual who was part of a fabric that was, in general, hostile, and he got elected twice, right? So, I mean, so this dude was hostile to the idea of all Americans have the right to vote, but through pressure, I mean, you know, women, suffragists came in, pressured this dude, protested, they went to his, uh, they went outside the White House for, you know, weeks, and uh, eventually Woodrow Wilson came around to the idea of women having the right to vote, right? But this is also speaks to the power of the people and the power of protest, the power of agitation, the power of activism. And so I think that there's so much to see about the elasticity of democracy and even our concept of democracy. And this is to quote Frederick Douglass, you know, power doesn't concede anything without protest. And so in this case, we have, you know, women who are, you know, pushing, prodding, demanding the expansion of democracy. And it's being, you know, of course, uh, resisted at so many different fronts, violently against women, but eventually we see uh, these concessions. And I think that, you know, there, there's a lot that we can see about our own uh, power as teachers to, um, even if our textbooks aren't always representing a full picture, all this power that we often have with providing uh, disruptions in some of these interpretations. And it's almost like we planned this conversation just in the, in the sense of the fact that I'm sitting here um, listening to you, number one, do a great um, just viewpoint of all of the different things that you could incorporate into discussions about who Woodrow Wilson was and the external and internal uh, impact of everything going on in society around that time. And then you transition right into the power that teachers have. And I've been sitting here um, thinking about power structures in, in our conversation and before that, um, because as you just pointed out, you know, there is so much content in history and just in one individual's administration and the world around him um, at that time. And what we talk about, and I keep going back to this, you know, there is a finite aspect of it in every aspect of life, in our class, in a, a unit, in 
what one can learn in, in one's life. Um, but what do we do with the time that we have and the students' time that we have? And when we, when we choose things to focus on, whether they be content or skills, we are, we are asserting power in the classroom. And finding ways to, to give that power uh, away from me to the students in terms of what they are interested in is something that I really want to focus on right now um, because there is so much content out there and, there and we have skills that we know are important to develop in terms of being able to analyze sources and, and, and writing um, you know, uh, evidence-based arguments and, and things like that that are of value. And there are content areas that either I'm passionate about or that I think are important that I want to include, but I also want to develop a curriculum that allows students to have the power themselves um, to explore things with the input of their educator um, in a way um, that is effective and helpful. I say all of that acknowledging that school is still school and maybe this is the, 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 the biases that I have in my head about what school is. But I also just know that as human beings, we, we don't do well purely open source. You know, you need some positive constraints. You need direction in order to really build something. And just saying, you know, learn what you want doesn't work um, for you. Know, doesn't work for me. It doesn't work for a lot of us. So it's developing a way of, of giving power, uh, getting power out of the hands of the educator in the room, um, but also doing it in a way that promotes effective growth as students. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, one thing I've learned is that students are motivated by so many different things and uh, we, and teachers, of course, all of it, we all are. And, and interpreting history for, for them and allowing them to also be agents of that interpretation, I think is one of the most exciting things I found with, with students. And it doesn't, you know, I wish I had some sort of magic formula here uh, to get students to be excited about their own hand in crafting uh, interpretations of historical phenomena. And but, but I do explain that there's a I, I draw this in some classes when they have a research paper. I saw this cool diagram one time where someone took a perfectly round circle and said, imagine this is all the knowledge in the universe. And. Every time someone publishes a PhD dissertation, there's a little bulge, a little small little baby bulge that pops out <laughs> at some little part of this circle. And, and that's the expansion of knowledge in the world. And you have that opportunity to contribute to um, some of the knowledge in the world. And even in our little classroom, you have a little bitty bulge that, that pushes out this, this concentric uh, circle, this concentric, uh, you know, this sphere of knowledge. So uh, I try to explain that there's something that you can do that's original. I actually, I give, then I give examples of students who've done some really cool original papers and that even a college student can do something uh, new and, and, and with interpretation and, and new research and that kind of thing. So they should not be intimidated by the craft of what historians do. So, but yeah, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a challenge, I think, for all of us on all fronts. Absolutely. And, it's, and again, these are they're kind of existential challenges and at the same time, because as you're using that analogy about the, the sphere of knowledge, I don't remember the exact quote from Neil deGrasse Tyson, but he had a quote about as your sphere of knowledge uh, grows, so does your, your um, like angle of ignorance or, or something along those lines. Like this is, a, we're talking about things and, and education is this a hundred percent that are lifelong endeavors. Um, so, you know, a, a a 55 minute class, a, a semester or year long course is not ever going to be fully encapsulating of one's education, nor should it be. And, you know, so there are limitations to these things, but there are also exciting, uh, to use that word again, opportunities to, to adjust and deconstruct the systems that have been in education for so long that limit students abilities to grow that that bubble of knowledge in the the grand sphere and you know i just think that we are living at a time especially with with covid 
um, happening, you know, in the background of a, a true uh, racial reckoning um, going on over the past few months. Um, that is, this is an opportunity that we as a society cannot let slip away. Uh, this cannot be a situation that fades into the news feed in, you know, a month or two. And I am still terrified that it will because we have so much time right now where we're not in the normalcy of life. Um, and we've been talking about this as educators that so many times we have these ideas of wanting to, to be anti-racist in our work, to, to break down systems of oppression towards a variety of, of marginalized groups. And then we get stuck in the cogs of the wheel that we've been in for, for decades and we have meetings and, and other initiatives and all these different things that we justify are as important as the work that we're doing and that we're just trying to hit all of the, the check boxes. And then we don't make the action steps that we want to make because we're so busy. And I think right now we have so much time to potentially really, you know, in, invoke a plan of action on these things that we don't usually have the opportunity to to invest in as much as we do right now. And I, I want, I, I, I hope to continue to um, act on that because it's it's a rare, it's a scary time. It's a it's a, a very serious time, and, and silver linings don't do justice to the pain, the real pain that people are going through. But we also do have an opportunity right now to make real lasting change in the way we do everything from our education profession to our society if we choose to act. Yeah, yeah, and I, I'm very. As I've said before in some interviews, very heartened by what we have seen in the last uh, couple months. And since May 25th, the George Floyd murder, I've never seen this level of activism. And it's inspiring to see the cross section of people who are involved in their whites, blacks, Asians, Latinos, in every region of the country, big cities, small towns, um, you know, men, women, young, old. And it's it's been you know, very, very exciting to see cities respond the way they have with, you know, laws being changed right off the bat. And I do hope that we don't squander the moment and that we aren't exhausted, that fatigue doesn't stop us from making more substantive change as we move forward, particularly with uh, the election this year, and that there's so much to be excited about and so much to be um, excited in a good way about the prospect of some some, you know, you know, I don't know about substantive change with Biden, but certainly not having this guy Trump in there who is by every measure, every scientific measure, like a danger to the world, right, let alone the United States, and certainly a danger to the United States in uh, the, the social, economic, cultural fabric of the country in so many different ways, right? And so you, you have someone who is, anyway, I could go on this whole list of, of what dangers uh, Trump represents. But if I think about the enthusiasm for the expansion of justice in this country, it's certainly not going to happen in 45's um, administration. There's uh, absolutely no indication that there's any sympathy to what is going on with Black Lives Matter. He's actively spoken out against it and refuses to uh, endorse it or, or, or even his vice presidents even say that Black Lives Matter. And I think that um, I hope that the, that this enthusiasm, the excitement, the activism that we see right now, the social justice activities over the last uh, several weeks, they extend to November, that we see some transformation and, and beyond the White House, too. I hope that in, in um, both houses, we see some some big changes. So, but, you know, Tom will tell and we will we'll see what these changes mean in terms of um, a Biden White House and a Biden administration. Uh, how forcefully might we see this administration respond to some of the, the problems that people have indicated and talked about over the last uh, several weeks and, and brought, drawn attention to? So there's a lot. You know, I'm not. I'm not entirely cynical. I've been one of the more optimistic people in my conversations, but I'm also, I guess, cautiously optimistic. So you know, we'll see. I appreciate that perspective on things, and you know, acknowledging the fact that. You know, even when, you know, there is a, a situation where, you know, say Biden defeats Trump and and that alleviates so many problems caused by 45, you know, that does that is by no means 
you said, and you even kind of were struggling with the word substantial change, you know, that is the beginning of another era of, of, of need for, for continuing to push for change and, and activism, you know, and, and just like we're talking about education, none of these things are encapsulated and, and finalized at any one moment. They continue on, um, as society continues on, but you brought up something just, just in the fact that we're talking about politicians, um, as a history teacher, you brought up something in my mind that I would love to talk to you about, um, in the last few minutes that we have, which is, there is a notion, there is a long-standing notion in history classes um, where educators need to be um, uh, objective um, and, you know, like apolitical and, and, and not ha- have a known bias to one side or the other because it can impact students. Um, and in my current situation, I don't, I don't feel pressure to go one way or the other with that. It's more of a philosophical choice. But I personally have always come in in my young teaching career from the perspective of I want students to know where my political leanings are and what my views are so that students can feel comfortable in themselves um, to 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 have their own perspectives and know that that's their perspective. I think the idea of being a political personally I don't think is possible. I think we're pol- all political on everything we do. I, I went to a talk with Justice Sonia Sotomayor from the Supreme Court, and she mentioned that you know the the term activist judges is is often used as a political attack, but really all of us are activists in one way or another, even if we don't do anything. That is an action in itself. Um, so I'm just curious what you if you've ever put any thought to the unbiased educator idea um, and and what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, I, I agree totally with uh, the, the judge. And, you know, there's, as you know, I teach or may, may not know, I, I teach a class on hip hop. And the class on hip hop, we, about a third of the class looks at the antecedents of hip hop. So we begin with the minstrel show in the 19th century, work our way up through jazz, blues, R&B, um, disco, house. Of course, we talk about rock and roll soul music, funk, and then we jump into hip-hop. And so in the process of going to these musical antecedents, these different cultural predecessors, I look at Paul Robeson, who was a, the, the most famous solo singer in the United States in the 1940s, who was like largely erased from history books. And Paul Robeson, who was this international superstar, he was very, very political. And he spoke out against uh, all sorts of atrocities globally, and donated funds to Jews who were fleeing Nazi Germany. He uh, uh, sang on behalf of Welsh miners who were going on strike. He spoke uh, for freedom for black South Africans. He also spoke for freedom for black people in the United States. And when he did that, the in the middle of the Cold War, the United States accused him of being a communist. And he also said sympathetic things to about the Soviet Union. And going to Moscow, and he experienced you know more freedom than he had going to any city in the United States. And these are actually scientific facts. Like in Moscow, he was not barred from any hotel, any restaurant, any bar. Uh, he could not say that of New York City, uh, let alone Atlanta or Miami or somewhere, right? So, so in his lifetime in uh, Los Angeles or New York or Chicago, there were hotels and restaurants that were ex- for white people only. He never experienced that in Moscow, and. To point that out, shouldn't itself be uh, anti-American, <laughs> but he did this in the context also of uh, being sympathetic for the Soviet Union, and the United States revoked his passport. But he, but people said, you know, Paul Robeson, why don't you just sing? Um, don't be political. Just sing a song, dance, smile, shuffle. And so he said, uh, he said, well, if I made a decision to be silent on political issues. That itself is a political determination. That's a political action, right? So I, if I decide to be silent on black people being, um, you know, murdered in the United States or black people not having the right to vote in the United States, uh, but I speak out against it when it happens in other countries, that itself is a political act. If I decide to speak out against it or not, I mean, so so he, he said that it's, it's impossible for him as an artist or any artist, and this, this is the point of this larger conversation about hip hop, was that, 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 
art itself, whether one is conscious of it or not, uh, has political implications, particularly when you talk about black people in a country that has been virulently anti-black. So the very first example of American pop culture, which is the minstrel show, is centered around a caricature, a caricature of black people, right? That you have these minstrel, buffoonish, black-faced characters that dehum, de, uh, dehumanize and mock and ridicule uh, black humanity. That to come out with a black person who is sophisticated, cosmopolitan, smart, uh, ingenious, creative, innovative, that that itself is a political act. It's disruptive to this, you know, uh, this hegemonic image of black people as these sorts of childlike, docile buffoons and these feckless characters that circulate in pop culture. So so any, anything that he did, whether it's being a menstrual figure or being an anti-menstrual, cannot be disentangled from uh, the political landscape of, of this country and the commodification of, of blackness. So so go, to, go back to how we think about uh, teaching and pedagogy. I think that when we talk about U.S. history, similarly, we in a, in a similar fashion, we cannot imagine it being sort of disentangled from some political commentary by our silence, right? And I don't think that's even a possibility. It's like, am I, you know, am, am I a man or am I American? You know, which is it? And, and you can't just, you can be, you can't disentangle those two things, right? I think you can't disentangle this idea of, of being, uh, you know, uh, teaching and being political in that process. It just is. And how how much we amplify our politics is another matter, you know, uh, how much we, we are explicit about it. But we, like, again, we all have our biases. There are books written on this. Historians, every every PhD in history, and certainly in the United States, we, you know, we take all these classes and talk about um, how our own subjectivities shape our scholarship. And we, we you know, we're very well aware of it. And uh, I, I don't, I do not, I do not personally equivocate on my own bias. And when I write, when I talk, and uh, when I teach, and it's, it's very clear, I think, to anyone who is around my orbit <laughs> in any way, like where I stand on these issues. Yeah, and if we're really wanting to teach political discourse, if we're wanting to teach how to discuss things in a way that is. Um, you know, a, a constructive process in society and build those um, communication skills along with everything else that we're doing, being able to model that and being able to highlight perspective, not just in the text, but also the perspective that is coming out of my mouth, I just feel like is a, it's a requirement of the job. And I like how you talked about how much we choose to amplify it and in, in the classroom is, is a completely different side of things because I agree with that. I think that that again is a, is a example of a, a skill in itself um, in terms of just communication strategies and, and how um, you know how students feel in, in, in uh, empowered to have their own points of view in the classroom and, and finding ways um, to work as a community in that in that classroom environment. So no, I really appreciate your, your point of view on that and, and just in general, uh, Professor Ogre, I really appreciate you taking the time to to come on and talk, and I'd I'd love to see in the future um, us continue to have a dialogue to possibly uh, involve you with a, a class of mine in the future in some way. Um, if you'd be willing to do that, maybe it'd be based on a particular topic we were talking about or something going on. I would I would be honored to to have that opportunity to to have you be part of the class sometime. Oh, I, I look forward to it, and it will be, I'm sure, a pleasure. I look forward to having more conversations with you. It was great, and uh, thanks for having me on. Thanks for the invitation. Anytime, and uh, I hope everybody in your in your orbit stays safe right now in, in these weird times and is healthy, and um, I, will, I will let you know when this goes live. But seriously, this has been awesome, and I've been looking forward to it for some time, so I'm glad we got a chance to do it. Thanks a lot, Brad. I really appreciate it. And, uh, yeah, on a, on a side note, we have... Uh, apparently, my wife told me this that uh, I guess because Connecticut was a hot spot, or I'm not exactly sure why, but why, but we have these rapid test centers. There are only a, a handful in the entire United States where you get tests back. Most people take days, and some tests are coming back in a few weeks. Uh, but we're actually getting tests back within minutes. And uh, so when I talked to you yesterday about this. My we came back negative, man. So we're we're good, and we're very thankful for that. But uh, we went in that we do this. There's only one in the state of Connecticut, and uh, it's about just a few minutes from our house. So we drove down, and 
uh, both got tested. So thank God the family we're you know we're we're well. Good, and, good to hear. Uh, everything is good here. Yeah, it's the same thing. I wish for you, for you guys. I know that this is you know the country is experiencing something that's uh, unique and unprecedented in so many different ways. And uh, you know, wishing you and yours uh, continued health. Thank you so much. Yeah, we had the the same experience, except we didn't do the we didn't have the rapid thing as you as you mentioned. It's not everywhere. We were like a twenty four hour situation, but we're all good here too. And I hope uh, all of us stay that way. All right. Hey. Yeah. Fingers across, man. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much. We'll talk soon.